estuvimos pues, este, virtualmente por Zoom, bueno, fueron algo maravilloso para mí y para mi niña. Todas las reuniones que teníamos fue una gran ayuda para mí porque eso me ayudaba también a aprender más, a cómo yo poder enseñar a mi niña estando aquí en casa, a cómo hacerla que ella se sintiera, que estuviera feliz a pesar de no salir afuera. Entonces, toda la información, toda la ayuda que nos dieron las maestras, muchas gracias. Estoy afectada directamente por la enfermedad, entonces este, necesita uno mucho apoyo moral y mucha ayuda este, que ella, ella te brinda con las palabras adecuadas que tiene para tú pasar y sobrellevar el trauma que tienes de esta enfermedad. Y en lo otro, pues la agencia me ha ayudado, la verdad a mí me ha ayudado con comida, que, que aquí ellos reparten semanalmente, y también me ha ayudado con este, también que nos han dado para mantenernos en casa y que no nos estresemos, porque el, el estrés es algo que ataca a todos, desde el más pequeño hasta el más grande. now that we have this COVID-19. As you see, I'm on a wheelchair. I cannot go too far. I would love for this to continue to get food because I cannot afford to buy food for me and my children. I live on one income and I am very thankful and very grateful uh, to this service here. Durante la cuarentena realizamos diferentes actividades que ayudaron a mis niños a desarrollar sus habilidades cognitivas, motoras, socioemocionales, además de pasar ratos muy agradables en familia. Gracias a que pertenecemos al grupo PCD, pudimos compartirlos con otras mamis para ayudarles y alentarlas a decirles que en familia sí se puede, en familia todo es mejor. Good evening. Thank you for joining us on this extraordinary occasion. Thank you for your time and your support. I'm Dr. Cappy Collins. I'm an environmental pediatrician here in East Harlem, and I couldn't serve my families without the help of Little Sisters, so I'm grateful to be part of this family. Little Sisters has been an integral part of East Harlem for over 60 years. And during this time, our mission has been consistent help the most vulnerable families in our communities on their way to excellent health and achievement. We've always had challenges, but none like the current ones. As we respond to immediate needs, we're also looking forward. How can we build a stronger East Harlem? Injustice in the form of health disparities and achievement gaps are old problems that have no good reason to persist for the simple fact that they are preventable. We have new opportunities to change the landscape. We know the social determinants of health that predict success. When we listen to the needs of families, when we bring together the stakeholders, in our communities and when we provide effective services to target the foundation of those disparities, we build a healthy neighborhood by design. This language of change is spoken in familiar words. You'll hear our guests tonight talk about fundamentals like food security, education, economic stability, And when we speak this same language of change as our diverse partners, 
we can change the world starting here in East Harlem. I'd now like to introduce Maria Inahosa, president and founder of the Futuro Media Group and author of Once I Was You, a memoir of love and hate in a torn America and our moderator and guide on this journey tonight. Hey everyone, you know I love East Harlem. Oh, I don't just love it, I adore East Harlem. It's one of the first communities when I got to New York City in 1979, where I was like, wow, I feel like home. So I know that you feel that way about East Harlem too. Everybody who's tied to LSA feels that way about East Harlem, but you know, it's, it's been a little while since I've been to East Harlem. I live in West Harlem now, and I'm really worried about what's happening there. I'm worried about friends and family and people I care for. I'm worried for people I don't even know. I'm worried about people who were those essential workers that we were all dependent on and the fact that so many of them feel invisible now. So right now, because of what's happening in this moment in history, it's really an, a tragedy, but it also presents an opportunity to do something big, right? How, are, how are, is everybody gonna come together to help East Harlem recover and, and be, be that thriving source of energy and employment and hope and love and professionalism that we know it all can be? So Cappy talked about the social determinants of health as you know fundamental to recovering, recovery. And this conversation with our experts is, for, is gonna be framed around those social determinants um, and how they interconnect to strengthen a community and how the various sector, sectors that are represented by our guests, who you'll meet in a moment, healthcare, philanthropy, community banking and finance and community-based organizations like LSA. So how do these organizations come together in a thoughtful way, coordinated. I mean, we, we, we can do this. We are New Yorkers, we can be coordinated and help revitalize East Harlem uh, once again. So our panel of experts is Dr. Cappy Collins, who you just met, he's a pediatrician and public health specialist with both Mount Sinai and Northwell Hospital Systems. Dr. Jeremy Boll is the executive vice president and chief clinical officer at Mount Sinai Health System. Uh, Derek Ferguson is the Chief Operating Officer of the Robin Hood Foundation. Carlos Naldon is the President and CEO of Ponce Bank. And Virginia Ch Chambers, who you're going to meet shortly, uh, was born and raised in East Harlem at the Jefferson Housing Project. Go Jefferson! Uh, and LSA has been a part of her life since her childhood. And now she's an LSA board member. We love that. And she's a senior executive at AT&T. And we're going to hear from Virginia in a minute. So Jeremy, um, I want to start with you. Um, you know, there have been a lot of changes in the way that healthcare is delivered in a place like East Harlem. And a lot of it is really interesting in the sense that there's a real move to community-based healthcare. So um, how do you see the roles of community-based organizations like LSA where many people are now arriving first, instead of going to an emergency room for all kinds of rich, very interesting reasons. But how do you see the roles of a community-based organization like LSA and an organization as big as Mount Sinai? How do they come together and help reshape this recovery? Maria, thank you. It is an honor to participate in this forum today. And uh, I have a personal history with LSA. Uh, going back to the 1990s when I was a resident in Mount Sinai, struggling to figure out why so many of our patients were falling through the cracks and not getting the care they need. And it was really through LSA that I learned that the health care that we were delivering at Mount Sinai was only a small piece of what people needed to be well uh, and to stay well. Um, and it was really uh, the social determinants that were uh, at least equally important and in many cases more important uh, than what we were able to offer at Mount Sinai. So. Um, I would say that in my view, uh, we have to change our mindsets. Organizations like LSA and other community-based organizations, they are the behemoths. They are the ones that stabilize our communities. Um, and it's our job at hospitals and health systems and the like to partner with them and to listen to them and figure out how we can fit in as well. Um, and I think LSA over decades and decades has been able to do that. How do we move forward together? I think we bring our expertise together um, and, and we listen. 
Um, and we focus on uh, a holistic approach to making sure that everybody, uh, who each person only has one precious life and we have to find a way to meet all of their needs. And the only way to do that is for all of us to come together uh, and, and focus on uh, the needs of each and every person and each and every family. Yeah, I kind of love the way you just talked about this, Jeremy. I mean, the fact that LSA is the behemoth in a positive way. And that's certainly the way I think of LSA as just this organization that has been there since I just forever and is so rooted and has been able to be flexible and adaptive, which kind of, you know, Bonse Bank also kind of a root of East Harlem also has been flexible and adaptive. I mean, so central to giving credit to a lot of these mom and pop stores. So Carlos Nalon, can you speak to um, your experiences now and, and what you see as necessary as part of this big plan of helping to uh, help East Harlem? So how do you see that and your role? Well, thank you, Maria. Appreciate being in the panel. Uh, I will tell you that I've been involved in healthcare and banking for over 30 years, and <clears throat> the same issue that affects the determinants of health also are the determinants of wealth. And the education really is the barrier that prevents both of those from being achieving. In, in, in terms of East Harlem and the small businesses, they sustain and they provide the jobs to the economy, the, the microeconomy of East Harlem. When we started in getting involved with PPP loans to help the local businesses, we found a, a systemic indifference to the local economy. Uh, we were prevented to make loans until the second round of PPP loans, and we now have done over a thousand loans. Um, but the barriers that we had to overcome were very, very significant. And so what, what we need is to have greater strength among the institutions like Sinai and, and Robin Hood, so that together we can begin to plan uh, the, a real solution to this problem, which can then be carried over to other institutions and other parts of the boroughs. Uh, thank you, Carlos, for that. Uh, so, um, you know, Virginia Chambers, as I said, is an LSA board member. Um, she's a global strategic account leader at at and and she grew up in East Harlem, and she's really achieved the success that we wish for everybody, right? Um, and we wish that for all of the LSA clients. Um, so Virginia is going to talk to us a little bit about her personal experience of growing up in East Harlem and her involvement with LSA. Good evening, everyone. I'm so proud to be part of this event and honored to be amongst this very elite group of panelists. This evening, I not only represent LSA Family Health Services I, as a board member, but also represent a community where I was born and raised, right across the street from our LSA home in East Harlem, in fact. For my family then and for the many families that are part of this community today, LSA represents a foundation of hope for a better life and future. Through the commitment of our dedicated staff and volunteers that support our mission, we enable our families to thrive, to feed and educate their children, and to rise up and beyond in spite of the difficulties that have been further exacerbated with the pandemic. LSA also continues to pave the path to success for our young girls that, like me, aspire to have a higher education and to excel beyond what at the time growing up in this community, I could only dream of. It was with the programs and the support of LSA that my parents and many families in this community were able to find the resources that afforded us the opportunity for greater education. For me and my siblings, that meant parochial school, private high school, and college degrees, an opportunity that, an opportunity that we may have not had without LSA. Tonight, we ask you to help us fund these programs by texting your pledge to LSA 41444. Again, LSA 41444. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your generosity and for joining us on our ongoing mission to continue supporting the families that need our help and very much depend on LSA. So if you want to donate, you can do that during or after this event, don't forget. Um, and that brings us to the question of <clears throat> philanthropy, which is really, really important. Um, so Derek Ferguson, I mean, Robin Hood, who doesn't love Robin Hood? It's one of New York City's most important and influential organizations. 
um, working to address poverty, right, to alleviate that. So um, how do you see Robin Hood and potential partnerships with other foundations? Um, I'm wondering, could you imagine something so large as a kind of visionary, let's rebuild Detroit, which took some of the largest foundations, Ford I know was involved. Can you imagine something similar being done for East Harlem? Well, you know, it really is going to require uh, that type of effort. Um, we're facing, I would argue, probably three major events that are going to uh, be difficult for East ha Harlem and difficult for everyone. Uh, we're facing a pandemic. Uh, we're facing the economic crisis that was probably on its way before the pandemic, but exacerbated by the pandemic. And third, we're facing a crisis of, of, of racial um, conflict, right? Uh, not, not a new issue, but one that has come to light and that uh, many people are engaged on and want to see change. So we have three significant crises that are impacting the East Harlem community as well as uh, many New Yorkers. One of the things we understand is that government alone uh, and big institutions, when they uh, attempt to uh, help in these type of situations, often miss the least of these and the needs of the least of these. So even with the money that the government, uh, you know, put out through the CARES Act and PPP and all of that, missed some major segments of communities that were really in need. Totally missed uh, the undocumented segments of our population, missed uh, mixed status households, and missed those that were already unemployed. On top of that, what we found was that those that lost jobs during this pandemic, about a quarter of them were already living in poverty. So all of that is to say that philanthropy must do what it does, and that's very important because uh, we try to capture at Robinhood, we try to find the pockets that were not addressed, which as I said, unfortunately, are often the least of these, and to address support and help to those pockets that were not helped by others. So philanthropy can play that role, but the task is, is, is huge, it's monumental, uh, we also know that we have to influence government policies and make sure money goes to the right places that it just doesn't go continue to go to the haves and forgets the have nots and we also need to work closely with other foundations and national foundations so that we can uh, really solve these uh, problems we face right because you know i mean anybody who was in manhattan <clears throat> who was in manhattan during you know at the height of the pandemic which i was also i'm also a survivor of covid and I just remember, um, you know, we weren't actually getting food deliveries, but I could hear all of the delivery men on their bicycles coming and going, coming and going. And so part of the problem I feel is that we're essential and yet we're also invisible at the same time and that this pandemic has really kind of heightened that feeling. So I'm wondering, Carlos, how is it that you, I run a nonprofit as well, so how does uh, the banking, business, financial, how do you work with, for example, can you envision working with foundations to try to start unlocking and maybe even helping to create new, um, smaller um, uh, grassroots-based organizations? How do you see your role in trying to kind of in, grow the impact of, um, of the work through foundations? So we are rather experienced foundation because we have one ourselves, the Ponce de Leon Foundation, which is very active <clears throat> in East Harlem. People have to think that institutions like us, we are minority depository institution and we are community development financial institution. We serve like funnels. If we get deposits, we can funnel them to the right places, right small businesses in, in the area. Without those deposits, it's very hard for us to do that. And so one excellent way of working with large uh, philanthropic institutions is to have them place deposits, which are insured uh, by the government in our institution, so we can then funnel them into the right investments in the local communities. Um, so I wanna kind of follow up on that. Um, Derek, I wanna to talk to you about 
um, early education. This is really an important part of what um, LSA does. So, um, you know, the, the, the whole upending of education right now, people just, I'm so thankful I have adult children. Um, I, but, you know, there is no disagreement that what happens from birth to three years old is really critical in terms of healthy child development. And you, um, Derek, have really, um, you've supported LSA's parenting and child development uh, programs. Um, so I guess we just want to know, what kind of difference does it make to all of us in the long run when you have these early childhood development programs? And um, how, how do we, you know, how can we talk about investment in the youngest um, citizens, people um, who are in these communities? I mean, to me, it's kind of obvious if you look at demographic charts and you understand something about Latino consumer power, that's me. But what, what do you think in terms of trying to really help people to understand the importance of investing in early childhood? Well, you know, what is really alarming is how predictable sustained poverty is if certain things don't happen, especially at young ages. So even before birth, you know, maternal health, uh, you know, is an important factor. But then, you know, there's so much that can be predicted, as I know some of my physicians uh, here would confirm, just by a birth weight uh, of a child. And, you know, we, we, we do know that there are, you know, connections between each of these activities at an early age and the predictability of what a child's life will, will end up being. And we, we look to support and intervene along the way, along the, uh, you know, the, the, the lifeline of everyone. But the older someone gets, the more difficult the interventions are and the likelihood of success goes down. So making sure we focus on the early age, zero to three, has been a big focus of Robin Hood as we look to really move households out of poverty and support that. Uh, we've had special initiatives that really focus on that, but you know, as early as, as birth weight to pre-reading, pre-math skills by the age of three, these are critical to the development and the future of, uh, of the community and of, of young people. Uh, we have supported LSA over the years and uh, would love for you to take a look at this clip uh, about LSA, which really talks about the organization and Robin Hood has supported it since 1998 and we're very proud to be a supporter and proud of the work that they do. Thank you for everything. I am happy to have someone with me helping me with my homework. Thank you. I love learning, dancing, singing with my teacher, Amy. I love practicing reading with my tutor. Hi guys, my name is Carlos. Thank you so much. I love getting to see my friends and teachers every week. I learn about talk about my emotions. I learn about building my own feelings and feelings to others. I love to sing along with Miss Amy. I love coloring papers and the stickers. We have been working on all projects together. We are so grateful for all of your support. And thank you. I love you all. That, we, that video was like amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your students with us. We appreciate that. So we've talked about these three social determinants, right, of health that Cappy talked about earlier. Health and healthcare, economic stability, and education. And I want to talk for a moment about food insecurity and how important that is to childhood development. And as I said, I live in West Harlem, but these are tied communities. And I know just from walking out onto the street and seeing the food bank, that the lines have gotten much longer and the diversity of the people in the lines has really intensified. Um, even my students at Barnard College, their families, many of whom are 
Latino and Mexican immigrants have ended up depending and having problems with food security. So East Harlem has some of the unhealthiest housing in the nation as well. Um, and, you know, um, there is something though that's kind of incredible, which because Cappy, you developed this unique program in conjunction with LSA, it's called Cada Paso, love it. Um, it's a large network of families that support one another, but it's also allowing families to become healthier and more aware of these community resources because, you know, nosotros hablamos entre nosotros, we're always talking about what's going on. Maybe it's chisme, but everybody knows when there's a good program that's having an impact, this stuff actually passes like wildfire in our communities. So I wanted to know, Gabi, if you can speak to the issues of food security, the built environment, housing, and the role of social and community context, and the Cada Paso walking program. Um, you know, how does something like Cada Paso, the walking program, I love this, I'm going to come and join you, I promise, even though I'm an early morning boxer, so if you ever do boxing, we can talk about that. Um, so how can these programs be supported and rolled out um, as we're thinking, and people are thinking a lot in the Latino, Latina community, like, I need to be healthier. I need to lose those 10 to 15 pounds. I need to eat better. So talk to us, Kathy. Thank you, Maria. First, I want to reiterate that your support is critical to helping these families. So please text LSA to 41444. LSA to 41444. So Cada Paso is a walking program on the face of it. And we, we certainly walk. We've covered over 5,000 miles traversing all corners of East Harlem. But under the hood, we're building social capital as we connect families to the resources that meet their self-identified needs. Dentists, well, we walk to the dentist as a group. We walk in the front door. We sign up for insurance. We sign up for an appointment on the spot. Food, well, we work with the city to distribute health bucks to spend at our green markets. We walk to Little Sisters itself to take advantage of their food pantry. Money, if you need a bank account and you're not fully documented, we can work with families to bring a uh, IDNYC card to a credit union to get an account. So all of these immediate needs are being responded to while we're doing it in a social format, right? We meet in a communal space, in the playground of the neighborhood. The families catch up. The adults are talking about resources they know of. We're just spending time together while all the children are playing together. And we explore the neighborhood. We essentially activate East Harlem for our families. I think that's the real power of uh, programming in East Harlem is that we can do things together that bring partners together and activate all the existing resources. And I'm really proud to work with Little Sisters to uh, help our families become part of the solutions that they've identified for their own needs. That was great. Thank you, Kathy. I do want to come and walk with you. I yeah, wait. We're going to have to figure that one out. We're going to have to figure that one out. So Jeremy, um, you know, people, some people kind of laugh at me when I talk about connecting with nature. Um, actually, I give my students, um, one of their assignments is you've got to go and spend half an hour with nature and then write about it in my writing classes. So from a medical perspective, you know, can you add anything to what Cappy's doing? Um, also, he's a doctor, but anything that you want to add to this from a medical community or economic perspective. Yeah, I just I just want to highlight, you know, Cappy mentioned that, that what they're doing is building social capital and that is absolutely vital. And and I think um, these are the kinds of things that, that large health systems like ours uh, really need to understand better and, and partner with agencies like LSA and with physicians like Cappy uh, because uh, we're all interdependent. We need to be in, see ourselves as, as being interdependent if we're going to create a, an ecosystem where people can really thrive um, and have self-efficacy and agency. And that's what I see happening in the work that Cappy's doing. And that's exactly what I see happening in the work of LSA. 
Um, thank you so much for that. I really, you know, I, I just feel like there's so much love for this community. Like I said, once you, once you're in East Harlem, you just gotta love it. So we're, we've been talking about these social determinants of health and um, how these we need to talk about in conversations and in actual plans and networking to come together uh, to help East Harlem heal because as East Harlem heals, so does the rest of the city. And um, we can learn a lot by what's gonna be happening in East Harlem right now. So it's actually an active kind of documentation of how to do this better and how to be prepared. And you know, LSA is really so stable in the community. Uh, the behemoth that is there, um, it's really a connector. Um, again, it's one of those organizations that people know about because they have come to trust and love LSA. So shout out to LSA. Um, and I wanna end actually by asking each one of you to give just one sentence in your view, like when you think of East Harlem resiliency, what do you see? So Cappy, let's start with you. The first thing that comes to mind is the power of partnerships, which LSA exemplifies. We work together with our families with other stakeholders in the community to bring change where change is needed. Okay, that was good. Jeremy, one sentence. One sentence, Samuel Johnson said, great works are performed not by strength, but by perseverance. And uh, I think that is the hallmark of uh, LSA and, and I think of the East Harlem community, the ability to persevere. We, we have to be resolute uh, if we're gonna continue to make progress. Love it. Um, Derek. Yes, uh, as um, a Bronx native and someone who is a chairman of a charter school in East Harlem on 104th and 5th, I can tell you that the people I've met throughout my life and I meet today, the parents and the children, are not people that give up. They're not people that look at obstacles and stop. They look at obstacles and they jump over them, run around them, run through them. And I expect we'll continue to see that with the uh, people I've come to know. Thank you. And Carlos, take us out. Carlos, your thoughts, one sentence on the resiliency of East Harlem. As a resident uh, of East Harlem and uh, at our branch in East Harlem, we say that uh, somos de la comunidad, estamos en la comunidad y trabajamos para la comunidad. Hey, that sounds like a good, good logo right there. Uh, I want to tell you, maybe maybe you got a sense that um, I'm promoting a book. Oh, that's because there's a huge poster right behind me that says, Once I Was You. But there's actually a beautiful story about East Harlem in this book. It's, you know, I was born in Mexico. I'm a proud Mexican immigrant, a proud American citizen now. But I was living in East Harlem, and it was 1986. And that's when I hear and see, actually 87, when I hear and see the very first Mexicanos on 116th Street and 1st or 2nd Avenue. And that moment is written about in this book. And it's a testament to my love of East Harlem and everything that it represents for the city and for the country and for the world. And so with so much love for everything that you do to uh, my guests here today, um, I say thank you, muchas gracias, no se agüiten, sigan trabajando, and Virginia, I'm going to send it back to you. Thank you to Maria Hinojosa and our panelists, Cappy Collins, Jared Bull, Derek Ferguson, and Carlos Nadon, for giving our, your, of your time and insights on East Harlem at a time of COVID and what comes next. As I reflect back on East Harlem, El Barrio, as I fondly, I fondly remember it, my place of birth and upbringing until the age of 16, much of what I recall is the unrelenting resilience of my family, friends, neighbors, and a word that I carry with me today, palante, which means forward. With your support, we can continue to serve this community in a meaningful way that continues to carry all the underserved families of East Harlem, palante. God bless and many thanks to all who have watched this program and given support. For those who would like to support our goal today, please text LSA at 41444 with your pledge. And if you ever want to see what we do 
or volunteer or see how your donations are making an impact, reach out to any of us. We stand proudly waiting to welcome you to our LSA family. I truly believe that the quality of life for each of us affects the quality of life for all of us. Here's to courage, strength, resilience, and renewal, and to the people of East Harlem. Thank you again for joining us today.